This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by United Airlines, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Fedway Associates, Berkeley College, education prepares us to reach our dreams, be inspired, and by St. Joseph's Health, world-class care just around the corner. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One coming to you from the Tisch. WNET studio. You can look outside. We're here in the heart of Manhattan. Here he is. Blair Underwood, it just says actor here. Let me give is a little background. It yeah, it says actor. No, but it's, <laughs> he's okay in a soldier's play over here at uh, American Airlines Theater right here on uh, West 42nd Street. It's going to be opening up on January 21st. We're taping early in uh, December. Also, um, you were in a show that I was obsessed with along with millions of others back in the 90s. Can we call that back in the back day? In, we can call it back in the 90s because it was, back, we can even say back in the 2000s. L.A. Like Law. Back in the 90s, L.A. Law. How great was yeah. L.A. Law? Oh, it was amazing, man. You know, I actually started right behind you no. at ABC. I did One Life to Live here. You can't like, see it. You Bob, can you get that shot? Uh, by the way, yeah, ABC is literally right behind you. Yeah. That was where it was? That's a, no, no, I did One Life to Live there, but right after that, a year after that, I did one. I did L.A. Law for uh, so you had seven, a, you seven years. So you went from a soap? I went from a soap to, uh, I think, a couple jobs here and there, but then L.A. Law, changed, it changed my life, man. I mean, from 1987 to 1994, um, yeah, yeah. You were a man. A you were Jimmy Smith. You were a Jimmy's, man. I, don't, I wasn't the man. I was, I was, you were a I was man who was an important was a, man. I'm going to go with that, Steve. It's true. With that. Well, it's thank true. You. Thank you. Um, listen, in the notes it says your, your first love, always theater. Yeah. How long before you got to theater? By the way, we'll talk more about uh, Soldiers Play in just a second. First time you got there was? First time to theater? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I went to college at Carnegie Mellon and studied theater. So the first play I did outside of... Uh, outside of Hollywood was a, call, a play called The Game of Love and Chance in Los Angeles. And I did Shakespeare in the Park in 93 with Kevin Klein and, and Andre, Andre Brower, and that was 93. But yeah, you know, for me, once I actually left One, uh, One Life to Live, the soap opera, and moved out to LA to do a pilot, you know, things started happening for me in film and television. But mm. my, my, my passion is always the theater. And What's anytime the I get one foot on the boards. Well, you know, I mean, you hear actors say this all the time, but it is. It's it's the fact that we're in the same room, you know, uh, whether it's cold and chilly. Like we're talking about how chilly the studio is, right? <laughs> Blair, right? Blair was <laughs> saying, what's that? going on in this meat on? locker? Freezing up in here. Yeah. But no, but we, we breathe the same air, we feel the same dynamics, we feel the same energy in the room, and that you just don't get in film and television. I love film and television because it lasts forever. Yeah. You know, what what you what what we shoot today even. Our grandkids can watch forever. That's right. What happens in that theater, you know, that electricity is gone for that day, and then you get to recreate it the next day. Let's talk about the electricity. Soldier's Play, set in yeah. 1944 in? In Louisiana, at Fort Neal, Louisiana. Involves race? Oh, yeah. Involves um, military life? Yep. Involves yep. a whole bunch of things. Set it up for us a little bit. Yeah, so this play, the Soldier's Play, started in 1981. I was one of Denzel Washington's first plays with Sam Jackson, Jim Pickens on Grey's Anatomy. I'm sorry, who was that, Denzel? De De you know, Denzel, the Washington. I heard he the, had a pretty good, I'm sorry. good, pretty good actor, right? It's pretty Go good ahead, actor. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I was no. born and raised in a boys club in Newark, and oh. Denzel's stuff is all, even though he was in Westchester. Yeah. Everything about the boys club. He's been a great know. spokesperson for this. I'm sorry. Yeah, just, no, no, no. That's cool. a non sequitur. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, so they did the play first, and then they did the movie 1983 called A Soldier's Story. Right. So, but it was the play started off Broadway with the NEC, give them much respect and props for that. And it's been in regional theaters all this time, but has never been on Broadway. Never. So it's the first time in Broadway after 35 years. But, yeah, Fort Neal, Louisiana, 1944. It's an all black kind of platoon 
um, at, 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 on, this, on this military base, and a murder happens. It's a murder mystery at the end of the day. This murder happens. My character, Captain Davenport, comes in. He's already on the base as a, as a military police officer, an MP, and he, but he's a trained lawyer, so he has to investigate the, uh, the case. See, all that lawyer work on television all mm, it helps, full right? circle, yeah. And who else is in there with you? Um, uh, David Allen Greer, who's amazing, three-time Tony Award nominee. Funny, but... Funny and very dramatic. You know, he's a Yale-trained, Shakespearean-trained uh, actor, and like I said, been nominated for three Tonys in the past, so right. he's another one who loves coming back to the theater as, as much as possible, but he's phenomenal. His character is the character who is murdered, and we're trying to investigate who actually murdered him. Mm. But this play, Steve, man, it, I mean, it deals... Yes, it's, it's, it's some race relations, but it's, it's about... Um, you know, the South, it's about uh, self-love, self-hatred, self-awareness, how we see ourselves, uh, without giving the mystery away. But it's, uh, it's a fascinating, it won the Pulitzer Prize in the 1980s for, for that reason, because it just really uncovers, Who wrote unpacks it? Uh, so many of our, uh, uh, Charles Fuller wrote it. Charles, okay. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Yeah. Not about Broadway, <clears throat> yeah. not about this particular play. Do you think a lot about race relations? Man, I got to tell you, I think more about race relations now than I did uh, maybe even five years ago. Because? Yeah. I think because the political uh, narrative we have, the political awareness, you know, we're all acutely aware of, of the dynamics of race and, and politics, um, which are inextricably linked oftentimes. Um, you know, when I started in the 80s, it was more, I mean, think about it, it was, it was the, the, the Cosby Show, which has a different connotation now. It was the Cosby Show, and it was, it was the 80s. It was the, mm. you know, good times. And... Um, and as, as an actor of African descent, you know, many of the roles I would take and many of the roles discussed was, you know, let's, let's find roles that show us as human beings. That's not always about race. And now it's a different time. You know, now it's, it's a time in, in our, our everyday conduct, but also in the world and in, in the arts where we're kind of really starting to explore even more and even deeper the, the issues of race. I don't want to make too much of this play, but it strikes me, and again, we're, we're blessed to have so many people from the entertainment industry, from Broadway joining us. Yeah. But it strikes me that at a time like this, when we are not, we're as polarized as we are, yeah. as divided as we are, as difficult as it seems sometimes to talk to each other mm. about anything, mm. does it make what is going on on Broadway in certain plays, in certain situations, and in the media, long-winded question, I know, does it make it more important than ever? I think it does, because the fact that you and I, Steve, we're talking right now, and we do, as you say, we need to talk to each other. We have to start with the conversation. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes on both sides, you know, our backs are up and, and, and we're resistant to having that conversation. In the theater, or a movie, put in a movie, read a book, but especially in the theater, you can be in the space and you can watch something with a certain disconnect. But again, because we're in that space and we're sharing that energy, you can feel it in a certain way, much bring more people than together. I'm sorry for interrupting. Does it bring yeah. people together sometimes? I think in a way they otherwise would I not think it be illuminates, together. I think it illuminates, yes, it does bring people together. But I think it also educates and entertains. Our job is to entertain at the end of the day. But, but it can also educate at the same time. Absolutely. You love what you do. I love what I do, man. So, so when I, you're a kid, you knew when that you wanted to either be on stage or just act, whatever you want to say, but be out there. Yeah, I, I knew when, see, in my household, we had to go to college. It was had a foregone conclusion. Whether you like it or not, you're going to college. Where'd you go? I went to Carnegie Mellon, but when I learned you could go to college and actually learn how to act and entertain, I was like, <laughs> yo, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to college to learn how to do that. Wow. And when I learned that they actually pay you to do, to act and perform, I was like, I'm definitely doing that. Let me just say this. The fact that you stay as relevant, as successful, and as compelling as you are from when you started, when some, mm -hmm. all of us fell in love with you and the other characters on L.A. Law, it's impressive, and I'm excited to see what's ahead for you. Oh, man. Steve, I appreciate that. Thank this you. is Blair Underwood. He's in a soldier's play. It's playing over at the, down the street, American Airlines Theater, 227 West 42nd <laughs> Street, New York City. It starts on uh, January 21st. We're taping a little bit before that. Make sure you check it out. I know I'm going to check it out with my wife. Please Thank do. you, my friend. I appreciate you. Make, Make sure you best. come backstage. Check you us out. You got it. All, All right. right. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. One on one is pleased to welcome Mo Rocca, correspondent, CBS Sunday Morning, and author of the book, Mo Bituaries. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Steve. Great. By the way, not every uh, guest comes in with their own crew. The CBS crew was just in here before doing promos. My it was you said it's in your contract? Yeah. They follow you everywhere? Yeah, I have a, I have a, a posse. <laughs> 
You do. It's yeah. a very impressive posse. <laughs> um, set up this book for us. The premise. Uh, a mobituary is my kind of obituary. It's an appreciation for someone that I don't think got the send off, he or she or it deserved the first time around. Um, someone who uh, might still be a household name, but is not remembered in the way that I think that person should be remembered. Somebody who was meant once maybe wildly famous, but fell off the map. Mm. Somebody who was never acknowledged. Basically, someone or something I'm interested in. You, and you also have a podcast to go with us, right? Yes. Did Farrah Fawcett don't take this wrong way, get screwed on the day she died? She did. She did. She did. Because Farrah Fawcett, in the morning, everyone was, uh, that morning back in 2009, everybody was talking about the death of Farrah Fawcett. Who didn't love Farrah Fawcett? And then Michael Jackson, a much more shocking death. Yes. Because Farrah had been sick for a while, died, and eclipsed her. And I wanted to give her some love. I have a whole section of the book on famous people who died the same day. And I think the 70s were, sorry, were kind of a sluggish time. I remember much of the 70s fondly, but you know, people were in a funk, in a malaise, right? And Farrah came along and she was exciting and she kind of- Could you know. imagine someone actually have a poster of Farrah Fawcett in their bedroom in Newark, New Jersey when they're, never mind, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just saying hypothetically. I thought it was either you or Tony Monero we were talking about <laughs> Saturday Night Fever. You gotta go Italian on me? Yeah, you yes. can do that. Well, you I, could. I, my last name's Rocca. I said you could do that. <laughs> yes. So Farrah Fawcett's one. Who are some of the other folks that you write about in the book that really we need to recognize and acknowledge? Uh, Thomas Paine is one of the people, and a mate, um, who has an, a New Jersey connection, but um, he uh, he is um, a, a Constitution great founder. founder, one of the founding fathers, right? Absolutely. Why did he get the shaft? Because he had essentially a terrible personality, and you know, so much of life is just about having an easy to get along with personality. Tom Paine was that guy that at dinner can only talk about the issues. I mean, he was pure activist. He's, you know, you, you, you know, even if you're into the issues, sometimes you need 10 minutes just to talk about junkie TV or something like that. I agree. Thomas Paine couldn't do it. He, once he was done with the American Revolution, he went on to Great Britain and he wrote a screed against the monarchy and hereditary succession. Then he went on to France and he got embroiled in the French Revolution. So he had extraordinary integrity. Mm. He was, Pure, but the other founding fathers knew how to shift from revolutionaries into statesmen and eventually started populating the Georgetown cocktail party circuit. And they knew how to have, to have some fun, and Mr. Payne did not. No, he, didn't know, he, he didn't know how to have fun, at least in the way Ben Franklin did. Okay. I'm going to throw some other names at you. Yeah. Um, by the way, <laughs> what's the connection between, I'll get off Thomas Payne in a second. Thomas Paine and T-Pain. <laughs> right. Well, T-Pain, the rapper and the pioneering father of auto-tuning. Um, who knows how to have fun. He knows how to have fun. I'm just and, saying. He's got, and he's got, as anyone who saw The Masked Singer knows, T-Pain actually has a great voice. But I thought it would be interesting to compare Thomas Paine and T-Pain. Um, and there's some overlap there. They both have interesting ideas on religion. Uh, and uh, and, and, and T-Pain is a great talent as well. What's your it, But it stands for Tallahassee Paine, by the way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Um, why are you obsessed with the station wagon? Because the station wagon, um, we had a station wagon when it was very, very little. Where'd you grow up? Outside of DC in Bethesda, Maryland. Okay. We got rid of it because the way back was a death chamber and my father was smart enough to realize that. Um, but it was kind of the one thing that made us like the Brady's. And who was more <laughs> all American than the Brady's back then? Well, at least the show. Yeah, I know. That was the image, but you wanted to be the Brady's, or at Agreed. least I did. And I love the station wagon. I really honestly think I became friends with kids because their families had station wagons. I just loved being in that way back and when the mom or dad would make a wide turn and you'd be thrown against the side. I loved kind of getting buffeted and like thrown around like that. Um, again, it was a death chamber. But, but it brought it families really together. Yeah, it we did. Had it too. You'd throw the kids all the way in the back and um, I love the station wagon. It died its final death in 2011. The death knell rang for it in 1983 with the introduction of the minivan. The other thing, and it's totally irrelevant, but I remember in our family, a station wagon was awesome when we used to go to the Newark, I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, the Newark Drive-In. It was off of a highway, obscure area, and everyone had the station wagon. You had the popcorn, you had the blankets and watching bad movies, it's terrible sound, you're yeah, too young. the sound, the thing you, you, you put into the, the yeah. like a look, a look into the parking meter type thing. That was the sound. Thing. 
That's great. That was the sound. And the drive-in, there should be a mobituary for the drive-in, actually. Thank you. All right, how about this? Your career. Uh, not yet. Hopefully Explain. there'll be a mobituary. Explain. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Hold God. on, no. <laughs> I'm not making a connection. Nice. That was good. That was good. <laughs> so. um, your first break was on Comedy Central? That was my first break being on camera. But my first break, I would say, was... The right. Daily Show. I'm sorry. You know, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and that was definitely really exciting. But before that, I wrote for a TV show called Wishbone on PBS, a kid's TV show about a Jack Russell Terrier and a dog yes. who in his dream life became the heroes of classic novels. You were with us? You were PBS? I was back in the mid-90s, and that was an amazing experience. And if I meet anyone in their late 20s, now into their 30s, they watched that show growing up, and it was storytelling boot camp. I mean, I had, we, had to, we had to take classic novels and distill them to 30-minute versions for kids. Mm. And there could have been no better training ground for learning how to tell a story. And Comedy that. Central happens when? After that. Okay. And that was great. I loved that. And that was really Describe exciting. Describe some of the folks there, some of the not-so-talented people there. <laughs> some of the not-so-talented. <laughs> so I was on the show. And so I came on right before Jon Stewart became host and was on for four years while he was there. And, uh, and Steve Carell... Vance DeGeneres, Stephen Colbert, Beth Littleford. I'm trying to think of the other people. Then Rob Corddry and Ed Helms um, came. So it was an amazing group of people. And probably my fondest memory is going to New Hampshire in 2000, um, early in the battle for the Republican nomination, which obviously George W. Bush would, would, would eventually capture. Um, and there was a big debate early on. And Steve Carell, Vance DeGeneres, and I went for team coverage, and we had Indecision 2000 jackets made, and that was the debut. And that of, was the theme, Indecision Indecision 2000. 2000, which ended up being kind of prophetic, right? Yeah, but, given the hanging chairs Yeah, in Florida. exactly. And it was, and, and the other members, listen, I said the other members of the press corps, they all looked at us, and they didn't know what the show was, so it was kind of cool, because it was really under the radar, and they looked at us like, they kind of look like reporters, but there's something off. First of all, the matching jackets. But we had, there was a big press conference that Senator McCain held, and I asked him a question from the international edition of Trivial Pursuit. Um, he got the answer right. What was the question? It was about an Icelandic singer. He correctly answered Bjork. In the form of a question? Yes, yes. He did it. He answered correctly. McCain did? Yeah, which tells you something about how captivating he was. Um, and uh, then the Thomas Paine would not have had that. Thomas Paine I'm sorry. would not have known that. Thomas Paine would That's not. That's a total non sequitur. He would have right. talked about yes, the I'm problem sorry. with the monarchy in I, I that threw you off. Okay, yeah. so you're doing that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you have how many years over there? Four years. Four years. And John Stewart, great to work with? Great to work with. And great model of how to kind of bear down and push through on an idea. Not to be, not to sort of say, you know, to say, yes, this is funny, but let's really work it mm. and make sure that the point of view makes sense. So. Set up the CBS thing, your work you're doing there, so people can check you out there, CBS. So CBS Sunday morning, I do profiles, features on all kinds of subjects. I mean, it's a, it's a dream job. It's like going back to college and taking only electives, which I wish I'd done the first time around. I mean, you know, I'm, at different points, I'm working on pieces ranging from the presidency of Herbert Hoover to the history of the pencil to a profile of LeVar Burton. I mean, it's it's... It's kind of great. I was the kid who liked the variety pack of cereals growing up. You know, you got your sugar smacks, your Fruit Loops, and then the Special K that nobody likes. But um, you but, liked it all. Uh, yeah, I never liked the big box because I like, I like, I like jumping around and keeping things. You have a pretty darn healthy philosophy. Pretty what? Darn healthy philosophy. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, thank it's you. It's impressive. Thank you. Yeah, by the way, let's plug it again. The book is Mobituaries, and the podcast is of the same of the same name. And I, I hasten to add go that ahead. the book is seventy percent new material. This isn't one of these things where you pick it up and go. I heard all of this new, new. There's no Fresh. station wagon on the podcast, but um, but the podcast we got some we got some cool things coming up. Check out Mo's book. Hey Mo, thank you for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Steve. You started on PBS. You didn't end here, but you're here now, and you do other great I things. I love after. PBS. And check out the chapter on the New Jersey Turnpike, the people that, the, for whom the stops are named. Other than the Vince Lombardi stop, who I used to always confuse with Guy Lombardo. <laughs> I think? love Guy Lombardo. Lombardo New Year's Eve. I, I, yeah, uh, well, the Italians. We'll, we'll be back right after this. Thank you, Mo. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Charlotte St. Martin is president of a great organization called the Broadway League. You, you're involved in Tony Awards? We are. We co-present them. And the other one is the? American Theater Wing. 
Yeah, what, what's the Jimmy Awards? The Jimmy Awards is our newest program. Oh. It's like the Tonys for Teens. 100,000 kids compete from 1,700 schools in 46 regions to send two, a young man, young woman, to New York to train with choreographers and actors, coaches, to win scholarships and to perform live on a Broadway stage. That's awesome. You know, I just heard about the Jimmy Awards, and in fact, we have a clip of the Jimmy Awards right here. That was from the prom? That was from the Jimmy Awards. And that was, what, that was from the show, The Prom. Oh, yes, okay, so yes. sorry. Yes. That was the Jimmy Awards. Yes. What kind of audience for that? Well, it, the, it's, it's like a real life glee. These kids grow up and they become our Broadway stars. The winners from two years ago are actually performing in lead roles on Broadway right now. Andrew wow. Feldman is the lead in Dear Evan Hansen. He's Evan Hansen. That's and right. Renee Rapp is in Mean Girls with a lead role. Wow. And Eva Noblezato from five years ago is the lead in the Tony Award winning Hades Town. These are the best of the teens in our country, and uh, it's great to see them just coalesce around Broadway, which is so important to New how, York City. How'd you get into the arts? It was a passion from day one. Uh, I've the luckiest person in the world, I got to take my avocation and make it my vocation. And I work every day to make Broadway more accessible for everyone. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in Texas, Dallas. You're a Cowboys fan? Of course I was. Just checking. Our president, Neil Shapiro, big Cowboys fan. We will not talk about where they are in the season. We don't want to. They're not doing well. Just leave it alone. We'll talk of Broadway, not football. Good. Okay? How about that? I'm a Giants fan. What am I going to say? Well, I love the Giants. Tom Landry. Oh, Was seriously? Coach, yes. The Giants and the... That's confusing, but let's go back to Broadway. Okay. This organization, your organization, made up of whom? Our organization is made up of the producers of Broadway shows. Okay. The presenters of Broadway shows who take them from New York to the uh, 160 cities where there are Broadway series, 200 venues, the theater owners in New York and around the country, and the people who manage the shows. So we are the commercial trade association that keeps commercial theater happy, healthy, and successful. Do you have a foundation? We do, and the foundation actually presents the Jimmy Awards and our other audience engagement and educational programs. You know, we've had so many wonderful, talented, um, and generous performers from Broadway right here sitting in that seat today and every day. Georgette, our producer in my ear, has this great connection to, to the arts world uh, and Broadway and We've had these folks in, um, and they come from all over. But the one common theme, other than a lot of talent, is this incredible passion for theater. It, it, are people just born with it, or they just step I into like? Are. I think they are. I think there is, and I think there's something even about theater people that's a little bit different than the rest of the theater entertainment people? world. Theater people. Theater people. They are a true community. I mean, they're hardworking. They work. You know, they perform eight shows a week. I don't know how they do it, but mm. they do. And if I ask them to do something for one of our programs for kids, whether it's the Jimmys or Broadway Bridges or Family First Nights, they're the first people to stand up and go, yes. They just jump in. Yeah, they do, because they know how important it is. Uh, as Neil Patrick Harris said on the Tony, years, Tony Awards one year, I was that kid. And you grow up, they have this passion, and they stick with it as long as they can. And by the way, who, who's in our uh, coming in from Modern Family? Is it Jesse? J J Jesse Tyler, Tyler, Tyler Ferguson? Yes. He's been on Broadway as well. Oh, yes, right. several times. Um, real quick on this. But your organization also promotes not just those who are on stage, but those are, I mean, we know here at Public Television, if we're not for the talented team behind the scenes, our, our creative people, the producers, the camera people, the audio people who make this all happen, there are lots of careers behind the scenes. We just created a site called careers.broadway. Careers.broadway. Check it out. Go ahead. There are 88 careers on Broadway. 
88. Other than I mean, being on stage? Other than being on their offstage careers. You look in the back of a playbill and you'll see all of those careers listed. And our mission is to introduce those. We want our, mm. we want diversity of in every way of what the country looks like working on our stages and behind our stages. And we work hard to do that. Real quick before I let you go, uh, the, our friends at United told us about uh, you folks. You have to work hard as we do it in public television for corporate underwriting. We don't call it sponsorship. Do you have to work hard at that? We do. I mean, because so many of the things we do, like right now, our Broadway Bridges program, our goal is to send 70,000 high school students to see a Broadway show every year for $10. Not I cheap. have to raise the money to pay for the that's rest what I'm of saying. that, right? To make it cheap, it's not cheap. It's not cheap, that's right. But fortunately, there are great partners out there. Uh, Charlotte St. Martin, president of the Broadway League, a great organization helping a lot of folks and keeping the arts alive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great Come to be here. Come back anytime. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One. This is the WNET studio, the Tisch WNET studio. Catch you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by United Airlines, New Jersey Sharing Network, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Fedway Associates, Berkeley College, and by St. Joseph's Health. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by New Jersey Monthly. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in the U.S. Here in New Jersey, one in every 41 children is diagnosed with autism. And when a child is diagnosed with autism, every member of the family is affected. While there currently is no cure for autism, early detection and intervention can offer critical improvements for the child and tremendous benefits for the family. To learn more about autism, contact the Binder Autism Center at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital.